Okay. Um, we're testing if someone on Zoom, if you could put in the chat, if you can hear us, that'd be great. Testing one, two, three. Okay. Testing one, two, three. All right. <laughs> um, hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, hi, Eddie. <laughs> we are um, very, very excited and honored to be here putting this panel together. Took a lot um, because everyone has very busy schedules and they're very important people. Um, and there are not many experts on this topic. And we are in the room with some of the best. Um, so on the behalf of Miami Beach Democratic Club, we just want to thank all of you for joining tonight. And we want to thank the Hotel Marseille. They always give us space. Um, they call them they face you. And they are just part of our family. Um, and we also want to thank David Sexton for being our wonderful community advocate moderator. And our panel, senior panel, Mandy Commissioner Eileen Higgins. And City of Miami Beach Commissioner Tanya Bott. And now we have wonderful volunteer cleanup. Founder Dave Dobler <laughs> and founder of Clean Miami Beach, so Sophie Ringo. <laughs> and then we also have two uh, wonderful candidates. We have um, for share Brittany Mitchell in the room. <laughs> and then we have one very special um, because he's up with a big opposition. Um, he's up against our state rep, and his name is Joe Saunders. And we love him. We just wanted to say a quick 30 seconds to the room um, because we need we need him up in Tallahassee for us. Mm -hmm. You took 30 seconds, she needs it. So, please, yeah. like, I'm Joe Saunders. I'm the Democrat running to represent you and your community and Florida House of Representatives at HD 106. We will flip 106. We will end the career of Fabian Basave. We will pray. We will be super great in Florida House. Really, the only thing I wanted to say is what I love about the Miami Beach Democrats is that you go deep. And why, you know, the Bay is such an important part of our community. And I love that this forum is coming together. So I have nothing but gratitude to the amazing Amanda, who also was one of my students. Okay, bye. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. And on that note, we're turning it over to our moderator. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Another round of applause for my I'm grateful for that. Um, just before we start, I ask everybody to silence your phones so they don't interrupt the proceedings. Um, there will be a Q&A at the end. Right now, we're going to listen to the panel talk. Uh, people on Zoom, please stay muted till the end. Then we can take questions from Zoom. Just to let everybody know what we're doing today. This is a discussion forum for informational purposes. I, I personally didn't know what a mooring field was. I'm hoping to learn more about it today and why it's a proposal that we're investigating here in Miami Beach. This is not a debate. We're here to learn. There will be a City of Miami Beach Environment and Sustainability public meeting that will give specific plans that's happening later in February. And you'll have a chance then to have a more robust discussion about what works and what doesn't work with the plan. But today we're just here to gather information. Um, so the panelists have already been introduced. Fantastic. I'm going to start with questions for the panel. Dave, hi. Hi. Who are you? The other Dave with gray hair. Yeah. So currently, our bay is unregulated concerning voters and docking rights. What are some of the challenges we're having in the Bay in terms of like waste and, and poor water quality? Um, can you share with some of the things that you've experienced? We need to borrow your sure, microphone. No microphone. Thank you. Hi, everybody. I'm thrilled to be here. This on? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm, 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 uh, I'm thrilled to be here. So um, I was introduced as uh, the co-founder of volunteercleanup.org. Um, but I'd like to share some of the other work that I do. Um, I am currently uh, the vice chair of the City of Miami Beach Marine and Waterfront Protection Authority. I am chair of the Biscayne Bay Marine Health Coalition. 
as well as a member of the county's Biscayne Bay Watershed Management Advisory Board. So I've been involved in Biscayne Bay related issues since I stumbled on the marine debris problem back in probably 2011, uh, when I was just enjoying the beautiful Biscayne Bay on, on the weekends. And I discovered the vast amount of plastic debris that was floating in Biscayne Bay, and more importantly, where it was coming from. And so marine debris is kind of where I got my start. And those are the things that you can see. Um, as we start, as we held our first Biscayne Bay Marine Health Summit in 2016, just a group of advocates um, trying to raise awareness, screaming from the top of our lungs, um, I started learning about all of the other problems that are ailing Biscayne Bay, including uh, bacteria coming from uh, raw sewage and septic tanks, uh, excessive nutrient load from fertilizers, uh, from failing septic tanks and also sewage breaks. Um, uh, there's a tremendous amount that is uh, that is ailing Biscayne Bay, and it really stems from pollution, right? Um, and so uh, we have lost over 90% of our seagrass in Biscayne Bay since about 2011. Um, and seagrass is really the fundamental building block of all marine life within the bay. Uh, and when we talk about having to feed manatees with lettuce, it's because there's no seagrass for them to eat. And so there's a number of things that are ailing Biscayne Bay. And what I see is there is just a general lack of regulation, so to speak, um, but it's just really quite chaotic. I guess that's the best way that I would describe what's happening on Biscayne Bay. The state preempts the county from doing a lot and controlling this. Um, and I'd like to remind everybody that Biscayne Bay is actually an aquatic reserve. It's effectively a state park, right? But not it's not managed like a state park. And so there is a, a lot of jurisdictional overlap between the state and the county and the municipalities, the city of Miami Beach, the city of Miami, different people own different islands. And it's just just kind of a mess, right? Uh, and so, um, what was the question? <laughs> what is ailing this game day? How much time do you have? And you covered a lot of it. And, and, and so I think one of, the, one of the, the, the main topics of today's conversation is around boat life. We've heard about van life, which is when you, you know, you get in a van, you travel around the country. Well, um, that is what's happening here in, 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 in Miami. And it is a combination. We need to keep in mind that there are people who travel the world in sailboats and they are retired or they've left their corporate job or maybe they're digital nomads. But then there is also people who this is where they live. They live on boats, um, whether they are, you know, just a step away from homelessness or whether they have chosen to live out in Biscayne Bay. And unfortunately, I don't believe that we have the infrastructure necessary in order to facilitate uh, anybody living in Biscayne Bay. So overall, that's the problem. And whether it's sewage, whether it's people parking uh, in front of uh, 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 other people's residences and blocking their view or whatever, we have, there's, there's very little right now structurally in place to regulate both commercial and livery uh, liveaboards in my in um, in Biscayne Bay. Great, thank you, Dave. Uh, Commissioner Higgins, in addition to people living on the boats, there's derelict vessels that are a real problem. Could you speak a little bit about the derelict vessel problem? Yeah, um, particularly for you all in Miami Beach, um, you can often literally look along Biscayne Bay, and certainly you can see people that are living on their boats. You can also see people that responsibly park their boats there, their boats are maintained, but you'll also see vessels that literally look like they can sink into the bay, they're an eyesore. Um, worse than that, they're often le leaking um, oils um, and decaying into the bay. And, and so there is a process for dealing with derelict vessels, which quite frankly, the county through my colleague, my previous colleague, uh, Sally Heyman, and now continued on through myself and the other county commissioner that represents Miami Beach, um, Commissioner Steinberg, we have put together a joint law enforcement 
derelict vessel task force. Um, the process for getting rid of a derelict vessel, it, believe it or not, it's, it's pretty arduous. A law enforcement agency has got to, you know, basically give um, DERM, which is our, the county's environmental organization, the permission to go through the process of removing that. And so this joint task force, which includes Miami Beach, Marine Patrol, Miami-Dade, um, the uh, Florida Fish and Wildlife, um, FWC, has really, I think, come up with a process that probably doesn't work as fast as any of us would like it to be but it has worked. The other thing the county has done in order to set that up is we have now a pool of vendors. So we've gone, you know, we are county government. We have to do competitive procurement just like the city of Miami Beach does. And we set up a competitive pool of about eight or nine vendors that anytime we finally get the law enforcement permission to remove a derelict vessel, one of these folks can say, yes, I'd like to, to bid on that and, and take that up. Um, what the county, and I don't think we've ever missed one, we also send someone from Durham with that contractor for every derelict vessel removal because you don't know what's going to be on that, whether it's cans of paint, cans of oil, something leaking. And so we try to have an environmental professional at every single one of these derelict vessel uh, removals. Unfortunately, um, I think I have the numbers here. We, we're probably, we're at 125-ish um, that we've removed since we started this task force in 2021. Unfortunately, the, the owners of these boats, obviously they've abandoned their vessel, so it's hard to find them. Um, we try to get the funds back because we, the taxpayers, are, are paying for this. Um, but in general, we're having to to pay for it, to make this happen. It's fine with me. This is important. This game bay is our livelihood. It's, it's not outrageously expensive. The state of Florida does give us some grants through the FIND grant process. And then we have a Biscayne Bay Environmental Enhancement Trust, which I've learned is the V-T-T-F. So anyway, I don't know. It's like, who's It's like, what acronym? It's B-B-E-E-T-F. So anyway, whatever that is, we have a trust fund um, that we do get from boat registration. So when as as boats and vessels are registered, part of that registration fee goes into that. And so, um, I mean, unfortunately, these are good boaters that are having to pay extra fees for the bad bad boaters. But this is really important. Anytime you see something that looks like a derelict vessel, you've got. Um, to report it. I may certainly have a phone. My, we actually have, a, it's not just a derelict boat. We actually have an email for any environmental complaints. It's environmentalcomplaints at miamiday.gov, which is, again, Baywatch. don't, yeah. Baywatch. Baywatch. Baywatch, they shortened it. They shortened it, Baywatch. Okay, Baywatch so, but otherwise, if you can't find them, email our office and, and we'll get it, we'll get it to Durham. And sometimes it takes a while to document. Law enforcement has to go out there uh, to do it, but certainly off the um, the West Avenue area, you know, which is in my district, we've we've removed quite a few vessels. Even though every now and then I see a few out there, and I'm like, holy mackerel, how can that not be derelict? But I am not a Marine Patrol sworn officer, so um, so please, if you see something, you know, let us let us know about that. Thank David, you. can we switch the order of the questions because? What I'm talking about ties in directly with. Sure. So, yeah. It's a, do you mind? Oh, absolutely not. So you, we want you to talk about the, what is currently happening right. with mooring and how a mooring field might, you know, yeah. change that status. Yes. What is the city currently doing? Because so, Sophie's issue is is really impactful and important um, from an overall environmental issue. Balloons come into it. And I won't spoil the surprise as to how, but um, but it's a much bigger issue. But this. It, this is related to what Eileen just was uh, talking about. And I want to clarify, make no mistake, I am not an expert on this at all. Mm -hmm. And um, I am not, you know, I've, you've heard me say before that when you run for office, all of a sudden, when you file to run, all of a sudden people expect you to be a subject matter expert on everything, which is quite amusing to me because I'll let you know when that happens. <laughs> um, but, but the fact of the matter is when you see something happening in the city, even if it's not your lane and it's not being handled in a way that you think is correct, um, I think it's 
I, I think it's incumbent on, well, for me, it was important to stand up and, and change the conversation. Um, and, and here's why. Um, and I'm going to take it back a little bit before I talk about the specific answers. Um, we are not a yet a country that survives or that, that moves forward by fiat or edict. And we all live with inconvenient truths or neighbors we love or don't love. And this, please don't take this personally. But the fact of the matter is you could live in the most fancy building in the universe, have crappy neighbors, or live in the most um, unloved building in the universe and have wonderful neighbors. And so it, it, words really matter, right? And so the conversations that we've been having about these issues have been using very broadly applied words incorrectly, and that is problematic. Because just because you don't think that somebody is living a lifestyle that they should, you're entitled to your opinion, but if it's a legal lifestyle, you can't stop them from living it. And frankly, I think on some days, any one of us would be quite happy to you know, haul the dog onto the sailboat and take off and never come back. The way it stands currently- <laughs> That's what we're- Not me. The way it stands currently, you are allowed to moor your boat anywhere in our surrounding waters unless otherwise noticed or legislated. And the fact of the matter is we are an island. And so I'm sorry if your view is being impinged upon. And I am sorry if you find it uncomfortable to have people who are living in a way that you don't understand. You're, that is fine for you to feel that way, but it is not fine for those people to then be demonized. Now, it doesn't mean that there aren't bad actors among that population because there are bad actors among every population. <laughs> but when people say derelict vessels, there are people living aboard these derelict vessels that are leaking sewage, or I never see anybody cleaning the sewage, which, by the way, doesn't... Um, contradict your concerns because there are plenty of people doing really crappy things, no pun intended. No, pun intended. Um, <laughs> they're doing really lousy things for the for the environment because they really don't care. But to assume that everybody who's living along our perimeter is one of those people is not an okay thing to do. So you have to, when you are a legislator, make sure that you have an appropriate conversation and you bring people together to have the conversation about what is actually happening? Are there derelict vessels? Yes, they are. They are submerged. And those are the ones that aren't going anywhere, that are half sunk, that are fully sunk, that are leaking and corroding and fiberglass is corroding. And if you see that, you know what you can do? You can call the Miami Beach Police Department, non-emergency number, and say, I would like to speak to a Marine Patrol person. I have a photograph or I've seen a derelict boat. Can somebody come check it out? as easy that, as that. And they probably know about it. Um, and if they don't, they'll add it th to their list. But as, as Eileen, sorry, Commissioner Higgins. Yeah, no, you've got me, Eileen. We're, um, we're in a democratic meeting. It's all friendly. Yeah. <laughs> so tight. As, as Eileen has said, it is an onerous process. It's like $70,000 per boat, I think, if I remember correctly, because you have to go through the insurance title search and find the owner, which you're not going to do because they dumped it illegally for a reason and, you know, whatever. So let people know but that, but then to say the people who are living along on their boats are derelicts or on a derelict vessel, that's not accurate. And some boats might be beautifully maintained and some boats might need a paint job just because it's not aesthetically pleasing doesn't mean it's sea, it's not seaworthy. And just because you haven't seen somebody pump out, I mean, are you watching these people 24 <laughs> seven? Because if you are, that's another conversation. And, and also there is technology that I didn't know, I don't know anything about pumping out boats for God's yeah. sake. This is the reason why I'm scared to death of van life because you'd have to pump stuff out. I'm like, I, that's more than I can handle. <laughs> but, um, but so there is apparently technology where you can do a lot of this sort of enzymatic um, dissolution within the vessel itself. And then by the time you pour something out into the water, it's neutral. <laughs> I'm not an expert on this. You might not agree with that. I don't know, but, the, but, but for, but there are nuances to these conversations. And I'm, I'm saying that because what we had last month at the commission meeting was an edict that this, the people who live in this way are not going to be able to come into our community. Well, they're in our community. We've got, we've got a handful of, of neighbors sitting right here. So the question then becomes, we don't have the facilities for this community that they need. And that is a very different conversation. And then 
the, the other part of that conversation is, do we as a community want to expend our shared tax dollars on a facility for this kind of community? And does that, what broader implications does it mean? Because if we don't have a really grown up conversation about what it means, we are just asking these folks to find a different place in Miami Beach to tie up. And it just doesn't sit well with me to, to um, presume things, assume things about people without having a conversation and having a making a, an informed decision about what is the right thing to do for our entire community. And I don't care if you're a tax paying resident or not. If you are here in Miami Beach, whether you're on vacation or just stopping on, a, on the way to someplace else and you need to get a sandwich, while you're here, you are part of our community. And we need to think about that and what that means for government, for our tax expenditures, for how we spend our resources as a community, what we value. I mean, we are one of the last bastions of, of welcoming politics and, 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 and thoughtfulness and inclusivity, and it's getting chipped away at every Every time we turn around. And so I don't know if we're going to find a solution when, when the issue comes to the committee meeting, but there's at least going to be a robust, open, I, I trust, conversation with anybody who's interested, anybody who's here, and the residents who are uncomfortable. Everybody is welcome because that's what a conversation is to try to find a, a solution. So I'm sorry, I know I went on at some length, but I, I really, really wanted that to be clear. And then the, to answer the specific question is that um, the, the committee meeting, which will happen in February, March, uh, will be where we have the conversation about what's happening with the dinghy dock. Dinghy docks exist. You can have a dinghy dock that is specifically just for dinghies and it's like long piers, you know, it doesn't have to be super long, but it can be accommodate 10 dinghies at a time and you can, um, you can tie up and you can have um, access to wherever you need to go and maybe you have access to it for different time periods, you know, two hours, eight hours, whatever, based on your membership. Uh, I would suggest if we do it, we have people who are registered, boat owners, uh, their boats have registration, they have insurance, um, they, um, you know, can prove that they're taking appropriate care to not pollute the bay. I don't know what the parameters are. Like I said, not my lane, but that's where we are. We don't have answers yet. We know it's a long-term issue because we're going through the process of uh, building a mooring field, which is going to take years just because of all the agencies that Eileen mentioned and working on um, uh, anchoring limitation areas, which is also going to take some time. So, but if we're doing things that we know we need to do for the long term. Why aren't we also doing things that we know we need to do for the short term? And that's where I'll leave it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Sophie, we are talking a lot about potential solutions. You're on the front lines cleaning our beaches and, and working in the bay. But what are you seeing as some of the results? of the of the ships the derelict vessels or some of the ships that are that are moored in the maze well first of all thank you so much for having this conversation uh, we do need to talk more about our ocean and uh, overall health of our environment because we all depend on it our ocean gives us so much did you know that every second breath we take comes from our ocean? It comes from the seagrass, from the algae, from the corals, from all these beautiful sea creatures that live in the ocean and absorb CO2 and produce um, uh, oxygen for us to breathe. So it's very, very important. And I'm really thankful to sit here with experts in politics, which both of you are. And I'm very grateful for that the city of Miami Beach is really the leader here in sustainability and legislation. We are currently having a ban on styrofoam, which is really important. I'm sure all of you have unwrapped a TV and these little beats when they, they fly everywhere and they are everywhere. And they're also in the ocean everywhere. And when a fish, a manatee, a turtle comes up to breathe, that's the first thing that goes right into their throat. And those are the things we see, the little things that we can regulate. Now it is really important um, to regulate also the things that we don't see. Dave already spoke about nutrient pollution, sewage leaks, and all sorts of chemical 
chemicals that leak into our bay and ocean. And what's also important is to understand that everything is connected and everything leads to the ocean. Every single stream and river and canal and bay leads out into our ocean. We are all one, everything is connected. So it is very important to find a solution and regulation of how can we um, make it better and healthier for ourselves at the end to uh, not have a, a system and get rid of the chaos and have these boats i love boats too i love i would love to live on a boat for a while too i think it's amazing <laughs> so um and everyone is welcome we are all one community so let's work all together for our oceans to figure out solutions how we can make it happen that our seagrass bat can live and thrive that our corals don't get destroyed and our wildlife can thrive amongst us all thank you sophie thank you I feel like we've talked a little bit about the county task force and some of the other items. I, I do want to move us into the idea of the mooring field. Well, what does that mean exactly? Why is that a solution that's being proposed? Um, I've seen some photos of it. It looks like it's it's like a parking lot for boats, so that there are specific areas, and then it can be more easily regulated. Can can someone talk a little bit about the plans for that? Yeah. Dave, go ahead. Okay, and then I'm happy to chime in for you. No, you, you, what? Go for well, it, jump in. All right, so I, I, Dave, I, I, Dave probably knows <laughs> the more details about this, but um, there's a couple of ways that you can park a boat, right? You can park it along a dock. As we know, on the island of Miami Beach, we don't have a lot of dock space, right? Um, you can build docks. You can also anchor. Um, you can just drop an anchor into, you know, it's not super deep here. So smaller boats have a long enough anchor chain to do that. And then many places have what's called a mooring field, right? So um, I'm going to simplify it. Sometimes if it's deep, it's heavier, but it's kind of almost a concrete block. It drops in. You've got a chain. You've got a mooring ball. So you've seen them floating like different colors. of. They look like mooring. big buoys. Yeah, exactly. And um, And then a boat who wants to visit or, you know, stay for a while or live, can connect to that without affecting actually the bottom of our bay, which anchoring, um, I mean, as, as Dave knows, we've got a, a, our, our seagrass problem is just horrific. And so anchoring can affect seagrass. So actually it's better to have mooring fields no matter, no matter what we're doing. Um, it's very common actually in many, many parts of the United States. Um, quite frankly, the city of Miami has a very large mooring field um, in, the, in, the, in the coconut grove area. So this is very, very common. And quite frankly, it kind of looks a little bit like what you might see. You know, these boats, they try to stay far enough away. They're not going to, because boats, whether you're anchored or at a mooring field, depending on the wind, you swirl around in a circle. So you're always far enough away so you don't swirl into somebody else's boat. Um, I, I was a, a sailboat racer for a long time, so I've, I've made a few mistakes oh, really? in my time. Um, <laughs> so, I don't know anything. This is it. But, oh, uh, I, know, I know how you, if you anchor it properly, you can slip around in the middle of the night. Uh, so, so Miami Beach in 2019, actually, I think we began the discussions and I the county would certainly be one of the approving agencies um, so we, we met and began to do some communities about what that might look like. Um, there's certainly benefits from the derelict vessels perspective, right? Because in order to stay, you, you would have to make a reservation and you would have to be able to stay, you know, to stay in the mooring field. And perhaps there would be a fee that would be charged. Um, all of those discussions led a lot to what Tanya was saying is you also have to have the facilities um, if folks are going to be here, and, and I do think you want Miami Beach to be a place where as people come down the intercoastal, or if, if people, you know, they do have, this is the state of Florida, you're allowed to live on your on your boat. And by the way, it's not just in the state of Florida, you're allowed to live on your boat, um, just as we are allowed to live on land. So so there are ways of, of making that happening and happen. And I know the city of Miami Beach has had a couple public meetings and, and they're moving forward um, uh, on that. Um, what's the right number? Where do they go? You know, that's all I think what the community meetings um, will will be about. But you can't just establish a mooring field and then have no place for people to come ashore to go to the grocery store, 
et cetera, et cetera. And, and so I think and, that's and why I asked you said you started these conversations in 2019. I'm pretty sure, Danny, you and I were in those yeah. meetings in 2019. What has been the barrier to getting the project moving forward? If you well, so, the Co count, well, COVID interrupted well, COVID, everything. COVID really, let's, let it, let's be, let's be real. Like give everybody a two year break and, <laughs> um, and government, by the way, did a lot of things during COVID, more <laughs> things than it had ever done before and acted faster than anything had ever done before. Like we saved people's lives. We got small business relief out. You know, we got you all vaccinated. We made sure our hospitals were ready. So we were busy. I never worked harder in my life than I did during COVID. There was no work from home if you were in local government. So so that those two years, I don't want to say in mooring fields are nice to have, but Life in the morning feels a nice to have. <laughs> okay. So, so I do think there was a, a hiatus and then, and then getting back and then also had to change the environmental management team at the city of Miami beach. Um, but I think there's been some thoughtfulness that has gone into this. And I don't know if you want me to talk about anchoring limitation areas now or, or go off because that's a complicated, that's another element. I can, to this. I can add to the more. Yeah. You do the more field and we'll do that more. Oh, good morning. So, um, the more the, it's hard to see because I didn't really intend to have visuals. And this is a, a draft, it's not a final anything. But if you can see it, uh, or you can I'll pass, pass it around, around yeah. Um, it, it's, it looks like bubbles, right? So, to Eileen's point, you drop a, a, a cement block with a thing that you can tie onto, and it's circles so that if your boat does swing around, it won't hit somebody else. And that's what that looks like. It, that is not binding. Yeah, you no, guys. Yeah. It's, it's a draft. It's a draft. It's draft. <laughs> I, have I mentioned that it is a draft? Um, but it, it'll give you an idea of what it looks like. So, but the issue is that we don't want necessarily to have mooring fields all along the perimeter of our coastline, right? We want to have some um, areas that are open, and that's where the um, the the um, ALLs ALAs. Anchor limitation areas, anchoring limitation areas come into play where by state law, and this is where we get into the, the jurisdiction issue. Yes. 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 Wow. Wow. Perfect. And um, I want this old 2021 if you want to pass it around. Um, so by state law, you can, a municipality can request that there is an anchor limitation area granted by the state, but it has to be approved by the state. So you have to go through a whole rigmarole and they will grant your request or not. So there are certain areas in Miami Beach where you are not allowed to drop an anchor no matter what. The mooring fields need to have the have some um, facility for dinghies um, in any case because even if you are not living aboard your boat, are you going in your, you know, let's say you have a yacht, a million dollar yacht, and which is probably a small yacht by today's standards, <laughs> actually a $10 million yacht, but you still need to be able to come aboard for your fancy dinner at Carbone, right? You're not going to swim across in your Louboutins and then, you know, <laughs> air dry. You need to be able to get from your boat to, to wherever you're going or from your boat to the vet or from your boat to get groceries. And so we still need to have a way for dinghies to tie up or tenders, whatever you want to call them. So the issue of facilities then becomes an issue because we are a small island and we don't have a lot of undeveloped land, right? So um, in Miami Beach specifically, we've got um, the Purdy Avenue dock where the Marine Patrol folks are. Um, that is under redevelopment and there may be a, a ferry coming in and out of there. We're trying to fit a bunch of different services into a small bit of land and that, that gets complicated. We've got the marina down in South, South Point. Um, there may be opportunity in North Beach, but nobody's looked at that yet. So we're, but the good news is we are now looking at all of this and, and having these conversations. Um, and, and that makes a big difference. I mean, I will tell you that two years ago, um, I don't even remember what which ordinance was passed, but only two years ago, there was an ordinance passed that um, authorized our sustainability department to have a task force to go around to all of the um, construction sites in the city to make sure that they were adhering to our laws of proper dumping, right? Construction sites, messy, toxic waste. Uh, guess how many percentage 
what percentage of, of construction sites were not in compliance? All of them. Wow, you guys are more cynical than I thought. 75%. I was blown away at 75%. But, you know, so that is another thing that we are doing to, to talk about the quality of, of, of the water, because it's not just about boats in the water. It's what we're doing on the land that goes into the water, because anything that hits our ground gets into the water. So let's 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 take it a step back and understand why Loring Field. So Florida law prevents us from regulating and restricting uh, people from anchoring and parking. They're allowed to do it. Um, however, if we create a mooring field, we are then allowed to regulate our waters. <clears throat> A mooring field is basically, has anybody been to, to, to any of our fantastic state parks? Yep. Like I love going to the state parks, right? Um, we go, we, we will rent a van or we'll, um, or, or we'll pitch a tent. And when we get there, we make reservation, we pay our $20 or $30, and then they have the restrooms, they have the showers, everything we need, right? And so the state of Florida allows us, if we create a mooring field, and we pro we provide these ba these basic necessities, then we are allowed to regulate the other areas around in our community where there is no mooring field. And so, by creating the organized uh, area for people to come for a period of time, thirty days, let's say, forty five days, whatever we decide we want to have it. Right, not just like overnight or two nights, but you can come, you can make a reservation, you pay for the facilities, they have a mobile pump out station, a little boat that comes out, and they they pump everybody out. So there's so nobody needs to crack open that little that little uh valve and and, and let stuff in. Um, there is a laundry facility, um, all of the things that you would need in order to enjoy your visit here. And after that, you go somewhere else, right? The mooring field allows us to regulate the rest of the waters to prevent at-risk, derelict, and long-term parking of the boats. So this is why the mooring field is so critical. If you don't create the rules and the regulatory framework and the infrastructure for boaters to arrive and stay for a period of time, then they get to do whatever they want. And so the mooring field is our vehicle to regulating and controlling what happens on the bay. Now, there are other ways to do it, but that requires Tallahassee. And nothing's, you know, nothing is very easy in Tallahassee. It's tricky. Um, it's very tricky. It's tricky. It's very, very tricky. And uh, I get the feeling after having enough battles in Tallahassee that they don't necessarily like us so much sometimes. <laughs> um, and so, the mooring field is one answer. There are other answers. Monroe County, and I've shared this with uh, Commissioner Higgins, we can create a no discharge zone and a registration mechanism where anybody who comes into town, they can they they will be required to register that they're, they're here. They're allowed to park wherever, you know, normally they're allowed to park. But then Monroe County offers a free mobile pump out service. They give them a flag. And so we know who's here. We know how to contact them if there's a problem, if the boat breaks free and is banging up against a bridge. We know how the, who they are. We can contact them. We can say, hey, you know, I don't know if you know your boat's going over this way. We provide the mobile pump out service. And the people who are providing the mobile pump out service are also eyes on these boats. And they can identify at risk and derelict boats so that we might be able to take preventative action and prevent them from sinking, right? And so this is what Monroe County has done and it's very inexpensive to do. We could do that here. That is one option that we can have. And I hope that we take a look at that because um, you know, I'm one for letting people come for a period of time. I wanna know who, who they are, be able to contact them and uh, you know, provide some basic services. So that's why we have the mooring field. That's a great answer. And I'm curious if you have this regulatable area, just like a 
a park, a public park, would we be able to police the pollution? If there's debris that's taken off the vessels, would they would be able to cite them for that? If we make that easier as well. Yeah, yeah right, right. You can, you can, you can, you can restrict people from doing sanding of the boats, right, and painting of the boats. Like they have, obviously, they have the regular maintenance they need to do, and that's all fine. But you can create the environment in which the boats and the 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 the, the residents are all happy. We're all getting along, right? Um, and so without that, then it's just whatever happens, happens. And I'm not a big fan of chaos. I'm a big fan of organized chaos. Yeah. So and if I if I might to build on that, um, you know, this this goes back to the earlier conversation about as a city, as a community, as a government, what is the responsible way to allocate and disperse our resources, right? We we have an awful lot of money. We have a billion dollar budget. We have some very fixed costs and we have evolving needs, you know, uh, and this is something that happens in all areas of managing a city where laws that were put on the books were done so in a time that didn't contemplate things that happen now or were, were, were put on the books for things that don't happen now at all. At, or laws were never put on the books because it was never imagined that something would happen that exists and is common now. And it's not a failure, it's just an evolution. And so this is an evolution, right? So there are more people living on boats than ever before. There are more people who have access to boats as a, as a hobby than ever before. Miami Beach is a more enticing place to come and live and visit. And we need to figure out how we evolve to that or away from that one way or the other. And again, it's not an, it's not an all or nothing. It is a conversation about what do we want to prioritize and it's the same conversation that we have when we say our city isn't as clean as we want it to be okay so are we going to put more laws in the books that we can't enforce we're going to hire more people to do more street cleaning i don't know what the right answer is but that's a conversation that we need to, to have and that's where we are on this and we're already taking the steps to uh, move in the correct direction for long term, but it's an incomplete conversation, and that's that's how things get done, right? They're slow, they're incomplete. You keep having the conversations, new things are brought to light. You converse some more, and you find solutions. Uh, Commissioner Higgins, yeah, I just wanted to ask you. Dave mentioned Tallahassee, yeah, and its impact on our voting. So uh, I understand there is a anchor limitation area legislation that's working yeah. its way through. Can you speak about yeah, that? Yeah, I can. Um, we have two sponsors. So just let me go back to last session. Uh, last session, a bill was passed or, um, that allowed municipalities, counties, whatever the right jurisdiction is, to take 10% of the water and make it an anchoring limitation area. So I read it. Our attorneys read it our regulatory people read it and we really didn't know what that meant. Like, how do you figure out what 10% of the water is in the big county are? I mean, like, what, what does that mean? Where does this go? And, and, um, and so um, one of my colleagues, um, Renee Garcia and I asked them to take a look at making some recommendations on, on where anchoring limitations should go. And, and Durham did that, which is our environmental organization. And, and most of their recommendations, I think, were really based on where we have very low water, you know, shallow water, um, very warm, very vulnerable to excess nutrients. Um, it's pretty much sewage in this case, um, issues. And, but even that I wasn't super satisfied with because it, it left large chunks of Miami Beach sort of out, um, out of that. So, uh, right now up in Tallahassee there, and they have passed Senate and the House versions now match, a bill was establishing anchoring limitation areas essentially um, around, I would say, the fancy islands. Um, so I would describe them. <laughs> and um, so when, when I went up to Tallahassee um, in December, I was able to work with both the house sponsor of Juan Carlos Porras and also with um, your, who is who's further out west in the county, and then also with um, your is senator, over? Um, Ileana Garcia, okay. to extend those boundaries to basically be from north of the MacArthur and south of the Tuttle. So right now, as it's written, it's basically an anchoring limitation area is 200 feet from 
the shores of Miami Beach between the MacArthur um, and, and the Tuttle. Uh, right now it's gone through every committees and, and it's passed. I am expecting that there will be some changes um, to that um, because of the boating industry. Um, because I think as we've all been talking about here, this, this has got to be a balanced approach. Um, boating is a key part of our state and our state's um, economy. So I am, you know, I've been hearing that we are going to see some amendments to that, which will be that a city such as Miami Beach could implement these anchoring limitations of this 200 feet as long as there is a managed mooring field in, in, in place. So I, I think that that actually is a pretty happy, happy medium. And it's the, you know, Tallahassee is a rough place for Miami Beach to go and get anything um, done in because, you know, right now I'm fighting to maintain our fertilizer um, prohibition, which is killing our bay. Um, Dave is, and our county folks are doing the fight to maintain the styrofoam prohibition that you all have here in, in the single use plastic. So it, it's a rough spot, but the good news is it's not just four or five fancy islands anymore. Um, it would, you know, it would continue anywhere on the bay between um, the MacArthur and the Tuttle. And I've gotten commitments from, from both the Senator and the, the rep, as well as um, this, our speaker designate that those spaces would stay. The question is, what do they negotiate with the boating industry, which is a very strong industry and, and rightly so it matters to, um, it matters to our economy. And, and quite frankly, these people, there are a lot of folks that, you know, that's, that's a lifestyle that helps also with our our beautiful Florida image as as a, a watery, watery, beautiful paradise. So you'll have to stay tuned from that. But I, I think we will get further along in clarification that is good for Miami Beach. It may not be everything that we want, but um, we just don't get everything that we want out of Tallahassee. It's a negotiated solution. So we'll, you know, I'll keep keep working on that. And I did get an update today. Those um, they may, you know, reach the floor next week, but they're not, I don't think they're the highest priority of things that are popping out. So it may take some, some time, but that's where that's at. Great. Thank you. I'm going to allow the analysts to have a final word, and then I'm going to open it up to Q&A. Does anybody, Sophie, would you like to talk a little bit about your, what you've witnessed? Yes. Um, so uh, I, I'm the founder and executive director of Clean Miami Beach. We host beach cleanups and educate the public about the negative impact that plastic has on our environment. And within the past five years, we have hosted over 316 beach cleanups and removed more than 97,000 pounds of trash. Yes. But that's only the things that we see and that's the immediate impact we are having. It's important as I see these beach cleanup as a gateway to environmentalism, where we really do education about how important all waterways are for all of us to live a, a beautiful and healthy life. We've all noticed the fish kill that has happened a few years ago that was caused by too little um, oxygen levels in the water that is caused by over nutrient pollution about uh, like all the bad things that go into the bay. And maybe, um, uh, you know, sunken vessels had an impact on that too, to some extent. Everything that is polluting our bay leads, leads to um, uh, over algae blooms and low oxygen levels, fish kills and all the other terrible things. So I am very, very happy to live in the city of Miami Beach where I trust the government, I trust the commission and the mayor to do the right thing on uh, environmental protection bills. I am very, very happy about the recent success that we have banned balloons um, in marinas, public parks and beaches and uh, many other bans that, that are protecting us. So, and, and it's not about prohibiting anyone from using anything it's just not on the water you know where we we're really we we don't it, it's harming wildlife and nobody wants that and uh we're one community and we can all do the right thing together and uh we spoke a lot about tallahassee it really does take a village so <laughs> we all want to want to live a happy life here and i am obviously in full support of, of boating living on a boat um but it, there needs to be a few things that need to be put in place and i think together we can all do it Thanks. Thank you. Well, you've heard plenty of words from you already. I will just um, add to everything that my co-panelists have said is that um, what 
starts on the land ends up in the bay, no matter how well intended we are with our stormwater drains and, and cleaning pumps and all the processes that we put into place. But it, whether it's it's street runoff after a heavy rain or something that just catches in on the breeze and, and sails into the bay. And I think a lot of, you know, all the legislation in the world, all the laws on the books are only as good as the education and outreach that we do to to advise people on that these are the new norms that we need to adhere to. And this is why it matters. And this is what we're going to do to help educate you and offer you alternatives. And I think that is a big part of what we all collectively need to do to start thinking about how we can make our own individual changes and choices and educate those around us. In addition to the heavy lifts of trying to negotiate with Tallahassee and change laws locally and change you know, perceptions. So, um, that's all I would add. Thank you, Commissioner Bond. Sure. I have to say yeah. last words. Da -da -da -da. Dave could say last Dave words. Dave could be last words. Okay, <laughs> good. I like that better. Um, <laughs> I, I just think I I think the takeaway from tonight is the Bay is complicated. It's at risk. The health of the Bay is at risk. Um, derelict vessels, which generally don't have any people involved, right? <laughs> but people have long abandoned them are, are part of that risk. But there are many other issues that are affecting the health of the Bay um, that are more dire than this. When you, you know, when you talk about the health of the Bay, it's fertilizer. Anybody who's using fertilizer needs to stop. Um, <clears throat> there's just zero reason to not have Florida friendly landscaping. Um, plastics, it's just got to stop. Like you've got to do everything you can to not buy anything with plastics. Styrofoam needs to go. Um, we live in a state where we as local elected officials are forbidden from doing the right thing. We're forbidden to ban plastic bags. We're forbidden to plan, sing, you know, to minimize the use of single use plastics. We're forbidden from doing all the things that you would think normal functioning elected officials would do. <laughs> but if, if you... Yeah. But I know, I know. It, but 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 listen, over time, these issues are going to become nonpartisan, right? And and that is how we are going to win. I mean, if if you notice who I worked with on the anchoring limitation, I'm sitting here at a Miami Beach Dems event and I'm working with two Republicans. Um, and one of the Republicans I'm working with doesn't even represent Miami Beach because there's not a single thing that he's going to represent that's ever going to get passed in Tallahassee because the Republicans don't like him. Um, so we, I have to find other folks that can help us with things like like anchoring limitations. So, you know, we we just have to little by little try to piece off um, things and and not not totally lose hope. And, and talk about these things everywhere we go with everywhere. We, and, and one of these days, guess what? You know, I, I'll tell you what, the conversation around fertilizer, it used to just be us. And then this green algae thing started to affect people in Lee County and Collier County and, and what we would call red counties, right? Um, even though they were turning green. Um, <laughs> but anyway, whatever that means, I'm not sure. Um, but those folks began to talk about fertilizer. And, and so every year there is a bill to try to reverse our fertilizer bans or fertilizer restrictions or rating system. And it really, they really haven't gotten very far, right? Because um, people are beginning to understand that water quality is connected to temperature and it's connected to these nutrient issues. So as much as we talk about boating, everybody in their own home needs to look at what they're doing to you know, to, to make sure we're minimizing every possible thing we can do that could end up being picked up by Sophie or Dave. <laughs> by accident. So, um, so it, it's upon us and, and you can depend on me to try to advocate and um, on the mooring field, Miami Beach really is in the driver's seat on that. And, but, you know, when a decision is made, I am happy to make sure that those permits are facilitated as quickly as possible, you know, whether it's at DEP, whether that's at FWC, and certainly the county's, um, you know, environmental derm permits would be needed. Um, but we, we're going to have to have a nice, moderate solution where voters are considered, and here's what I can tell you, 
if it becomes draconian, you will be preempted by Tallahassee. Like you will have liter literally everything Dave told you about if we have a managed mooring fall field, we'll be able to have some regulations and some ability to maintain these quality issues. If when you get too draconian about these things, somebody in Tallahassee that's a special interest goes to somebody, gives a big enough campaign donation, and then we have no, Miami Beach does not, it is not beloved up there. We love it. Um, they don't know what they're missing. Um, I would say it's not even a big campaign do donation. You can get stuff passed in Tallahassee for the low, low sum of ten thousand dollars. Yes. Yeah, so I got ten grand. Yeah. So, so just, just let's 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 be very cautious about what we do and the actions we make until you know March 9th when they're no longer there. Um, and and I can tell you, you know, our county. I think the county we are very cognizant of the kinds of discussions we have, because if we want to have some local control over these things, we need to be very cautious um, about what we say and how we move forward. And, we, and, I, and I think in the way that we are, you see everybody here tonight, we are thinking about this thoughtfully and about all sides of this issue um, and the nuances of how people live and how people vacation and how they move around, yet the residents need a little bit of quiet at night and, and, and all of that. And, and so I just think, go to the Miami Beach public meetings on the morning field, make that morning field be a reality, make it work for the neighbors, make it work for the Bay, and make it work for the voters, right? So don't charge a thousand dollars a night. I guarantee you next legislative session, you'll be preempted, right? <laughs> okay. So we, it, it's just, that's, it, it happens every year. They will pass a law saying you can't do that. And probably if you're charging a thousand dollars a night, it's unfair um, to, to people that do want to visit our community at a at a reasonable rate. So so good. We need to do these things softly, slowly, and carefully because human beings are evolved, living little fish and <laughs> the creatures are evolved, and our economy is evolved. So I'm throwing it Dave. Thank you, Commissioner. Dave, final word. Wow, final words. That doesn't happen with me. <laughs> Were you um, Irish in another life? <laughs> um, so I want to talk about why we should care about Biscayne Bay. Um, first of all, Biscayne Bay represents $62 billion in economic activity every year. $62 billion. That is a lot of money. I don't have the numbers in front of me, but that represents, I think that, that represents like 3% of the state's total uh, total revenue, right? Biscayne Bay is really, really, really important to us. Not only from an economic standpoint, I love Biscayne Bay. You'll find me paddling on the weekend and, and, and man, it's the only thing that makes me not want to choke people, right? <laughs> and then I see somebody throwing some, a, a balloon or something like that, and then I want to choke them. Um, so <laughs> that contradicts my next statement, which is really talking about love, right? We need to love these things. We need to love the people who are also respectful of 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 our community. Um, we need to show we need to show um, uh, we need to show uh, yeah compassion. But it, it's not that it, it it's not that 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 the people who are you know in the bay and enjoying the bay. It's not because you know of any reason. We just need to, we we just need to love one each other and and try to understand where everybody's where everybody's coming from. Not everybody lives the life that I live. Not everybody lives the life you live. Not everybody lives the life that these folks live. And so trying to gain understanding of other people and how they're living and what they're trying to do. And, you know, look, if nobody's causing any problems, you know, I mean, if you're not hurting anybody, then, you know, do what you want to do. Um, so I just really think Biscayne Bay is worth protecting. And I think we need to be reasonable about this. Um, and... I talk about clean air and I talk about clean water. I don't talk about, you know, uh, this political thing or that political thing or this phrase or that phrase. I talk about clean air and clean water because who doesn't like clean air? Who doesn't like clean water? We need to be talking about pollution and what we need to do in order to clean up this cane bay so that everything, all living beings, whether it's humans, whether it's manatees, whether it's the fish, whether it's the pelicans, all of that can enjoy 
this wonderful home that we have. We're so fortunate. And so let's just treat each other with a little bit of respect and talk about why we love our community and why we love our environment. Thank you, Leila. I do want to acknowledge that uh, Commissioner David Suarez is in the room, and I'm going to take some questions from the group. Thank you, David, for being here. Okay, first question say your name, and then after question. Hi, uh, my name is Elizabeth Bostone. I live in North Beach, and I would like to understand how many Marine excuse me, patrol officers do we have right now in the county, city, uh, in this area? I'd also like to ask who monitors the Normandy Isles and the canals? And is going to be not one to consider in any of this? And more? How big I can yeah. Several questions. So um, I, I think, I, I'm not even guess on the Marine Patrol. About eight. People, I was going to say, I think it's three per shift, but it's a total. So, um, not enough, no, no, definitely not enough. And, um, uh, Miami Beach Marine Patrol is responsible for Miami Beach waterways. Now, the tricky bit is where exactly is the line from when you're in Biscayne Bay? Um, where does Miami Beach stop and the city of Miami start? Um, but for the area that you're talking about in North Beach in particular, the canals, the little islands, all that stuff, um, they there are a lot of places where anchoring isn't contemplated because it's not conducive to that. There are a lot of places where it's happening already and it's going to get worse. So right now, the acute problem is where it's been localized. But the conversation that is happening needs to be happening on a citywide basis. And I have been talking about this with administration for weeks, and I talked about it on the days yesterday. Um, it is not OK to squeeze the balloon and assume that it's going to be OK, because when you squeeze the balloon, the air goes from where you're trying to move it to another area. And so if we don't have a holistic solution, which is why it's so important to have a discussion and find a holistic solution, because taking care of an issue, whether it's good or bad, in one neighborhood and not addressing it holistically, it's like the 2 a.m. rollback, right? It might work great in one neighborhood and be a disaster. Oops. Oops. My daughter from Mexico is calling. Sorry. <laughs> Give it to me. Hold on. Um, thank you. And... Um, and by the way, for those of you who followed me on the campaign trail, no, nobody is sick. She's just calling. <laughs> um, so that those are some of the issues uh, on North Beach. We are going to be looking at that holistically because we have to. We just don't have those answers yet. And again, there, the focus on this has only started about two or three years ago. And it it's very slow. And there are a lot of competing interests. So nothing's going to happen quickly, but it will be addressed. Thank uh, enforcement is a really big challenge, right? Um, at the uh, City of Miami Beach Marine Waterfront Protection Authority, we get monthly updates from Marine Patrol. How many vessels were pulled out of the water? How many arrests? All of this kind of stuff. Part of the challenge is that hiring officers and purchasing boats is, is takes a long time. Um, to get a new one of the new contender boats, it's about two and a half years. For them to order a boat, once, once we approve a new boat, like the Bible, we then put an order in. It takes two years in order to get a new boat. Also hiring officers, training them specifically to specialize in Marine patrol is a challenge. Um, one of the ideas that I've been floating around no is, sorry? No no pun 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> is, 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 is a spinoff of what we have in Miami Beach with our park ranger program. I've been floating the idea of having marine, marine park rangers, marine rangers, put them on jet skis, right? Where they can go and they can just be eyes on the water, identify problems. They are a visible force that, you know, look, they can't arrest anybody. They have, they are like, like our, like our park rangers uh, on the beach, right? They, this is a quick and much less expensive 
uh, option. And then when they've got a problem, they call in for reinforcements and they can come there, right? This can help enforce the new noise ordinance. Uh, that is being passed. Uh, I I don't know who else was the co-sponsor, but I, I think uh, Commissioner Suarez was 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 pushing forward on that uh, the noise ordinance and 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 stricter enforcement here. Um, and so uh, I think that having more eyes on the water would really help us solve some problems. And this also comes into play with the the no dump zone and the. Uh, and and the, the the mobile pump out station, right? Give everybody, give everybody the the the, the option and make it easy to not pollute. There's there's only there's only in Miami Beach. There's only I believe there's only one pump out station, and that is a Miami Beach Marina. And so you have to you have to move. You have to un uh, unmoor your boat, drive over there, pay ten bucks, then come back to where you were going. The sailboats can't go under the bridge. And the sailboats can't go under the bridge. So where where do you have to go? Oh, so they have to go, they have to go to they have to go around. And go to or, or, oh, so they have to go to Cran Crandon. You the next the next closest one I, I thought was at um was Pelican Harbor, but you can't even go there because of the fixed bridges. Okay. So so if you have a you know these mobile pump out stations, it's only like a like a it's only like a a, a regular like fishing boat, right? And they've got the, they've got a tank on on board. And they can go around, and if, if if you require people to register, they put up a flag when they need to pump out. The boat comes. It seems easy, in, right? In the west, in the west, of the city a mobile a boat. Yeah. This, is, this is Monroe County. Yeah, this is Monroe County. We can do this. The whole thing is actually funded by by uh, by DEP. So um, I just sent information over to Commissioner Higgins um, just a couple of weeks ago to to to, to explore this. Right. Because if we're you know, it depends what we're trying to solve. Are we trying to solve pollution and, you know, uh, uh, derelict vessels or are we trying to, like, tell people they're not welcome here? Right. My issue is on pollution. That's what I want to solve. David, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But, um, Let's not be mistaken. I'm, I'm for the point of view. This is building out a building marina. So you know, make sure that my contractor to build it out. We have all the boots out there, all anchored down. We need this in Miami Beach Marina Park about two years, but we need this in the Marina Park about one year. And we want to try more boats to want to anchor onto this side. Right now, these boats don't pay anything. They're going to have to start paying out of CFP. We want to be on the NPO and NPOs. All these boats are the same. More NPOs are. There for months and years, but it's not like if it's an overnight or no complaint. You also want to go to a proper facility for those boats to build it up and anchor thing out there. The easy thing also have to have the way a contractor to come in and pick up, you know, floating out of the boats. So this is operating a floating marina uh, property. So we have to give that food for thought. It's not just, you know, something they just put together there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'll go over the motor here. All right, let's more with a sailboat. All right. Well, I know. Um, um, okay. There's more All right. Comments. Thank you. Um, I just want to say, I'm um, Carlos. I've been living for three years in the Bay. They came the other night to raid us. 80 boats. Only two tickets were made for the oh, toilets. Yes. OK, so when people are saying all the boats are polluting, it's only two boats that were polluting in the water. And one was from Canada. So I, I do want to change change the narrative when you guys talk about us as, oh, the ugly boats, the they're they're destroying our view. I think we should look. I, I have an apartment, too. I think we should look in, to us first, see. I don't know. I, I don't know if you guys have passed by the canal when the pump is working. Mm -hmm. Have you smelled it? Oh, I know all oh, about yeah, the pump stations. That's okay. a whole other thing. <laughs> no, yeah, that's a different form. <laughs> <laughs> I think like, Next week's show. Yeah. <laughs> not at all boats are dirty. I'm willing to sit down with you. We know 90 to 100% of the owners 
of the boats, even the derelict boats that you guys want to take out. I'm working with one or two owners with VTIP, with um, FWC to get them out because it takes the city a year and a half, three convictions to be able to take out the, the, the derelict boats. It's not like ticket and in 30 days it's gone. It doesn't work like that. So why not work with the boater community that we've been trying to, to work with a lot of people um, to get these derelict boats, but we feel unenfranchised. We feel like, oh, we need to kick them out. We need to kick them out. And I'm a person that I go every Monday to the island because on the weekends it's disgusting that island. And I pick up, we pick up. Yeah. You, there's yeah. pictures of us picking yeah. up garbage in the island. Okay. And that's not even half. I see human feces there. I have to pick it up. OK, with gloves, you know, so telling us that we're polluting the, the the bay, you have to see what the charter industry does at nighttime when they're leaving. They're the ones polluting. Check the water level of pollution on a Monday or on a Sunday. Check it and you will see that it goes up and the seagrass as well. Check when they're when they're partying in the in the star island and they anchor and they pull yeah. when they have when they pull it up they take half of the seagrass Carlos. we don't pull up yeah. Carlos, Carlos, can thank I, you. this is precisely why there is now an item to be discussed at the public safety quality neighborhoods like whatever that long acronym is <laughs> whatever that and, is. and i want you guys to be there and i want representatives from the relevant industries who might be able to help us do things better you're going to be there, hopefully, for this, you know. When is it? Uh, when, February 12th. <laughs> February 12th. Okay. So, okay. No, that's right. That's right. I'll be with you. No, no, no. That's a, diff that's yeah, a different meeting. Um, I, I won't be there because I won't be here. I'll be with my daughter in Mexico. But um, but but that's what that's where that conversation happens. Okay. I, I I just want to make sure. No, you... I just wanted to okay. inform everybody that is here. Our so, 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 part, so part of this, right, is that... Uh, Voters are required to be able to prove that they are pumping out, right? And so this is a, like, like I don't know if what happened was a raid it was or a if it was a ten an enforcement. Okay, well, that's that's a raid. That, sounds, that sounds a little raidy to yeah. me. Yeah. Um, but, but, but I do not see an issue with having a required registration, a mobile pump out service, and then be able to yeah. demonstrate and hand receipts. If you are pumping yeah. out, for sure, then like 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 then yeah. that solves that solves half of my problem, right? And so, we, but right now we do not make it easy. We do not have facilities to do so, and so I don't know that we should be doing greedy things, but. We should be patrolling our areas and knowing who is here and making sure that we are identifying at-risk boats before they cause problems. And I think that's a reasonable position. I think that, I think that, that yes, yeah. right across. And that point unites all of us, right? It's everyone loves the bay. Everyone loves the water. That's where the common drown comes in. We need to focus on that. Yeah. Follow David. Wait, I need to follow David with this because the people okay. on Zoom, they told me. And, and we're, it's 7.30 now, so I think just a couple more questions yeah. and we need to wrap up. So yeah. go ahead. Yeah, Michael Grouse. <laughs> uh, they can hear. You know, the, bis the, the bay is a treasure for everybody. And there's no question that marine life has been suffering there. And uh, as we just heard, uh, individuals come and they stay for three years. And I guess my question is, how long are individuals going to be able to stay? I witnessed a boat that sailed in and wanted to put the anchor down. And there was a big ruckus, fight, yelling back and forth, because apparently the boat, which I've witnessed being there for three years, didn't want the other boat to come in there. And so, you know, it's a treasure. It needs to be shared. People should sail, should come in, should go on, go home at night. I don't think it's a campground, and I don't think it's a place where people should live. And if they are going to live, we have to decide how long they get to live there, right? So I, I think the question was, how long are people allowed to live on, on boat in the bay? Is there, is there a regulation on that? 
Right now? No. Um, if we have a mooring field or an anchor limitation area, we get to decide. And are you going to decide for against liveaboards? That that's why again that is why we're having these conversations and 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 somebody can be in a mooring field and so okay yeah. it is not nice. it is not yeah. it is not illegal to live on your boat in the waters surrounding Florida the <laughs> perimeter of Florida the coastline and in fact in I think every state that has waterways it is not illegal to live on your boat depending on the laws of those communities or that's those states. So again, as we said in the beginning of this conversation, you know, we might live in, in a, a, a condo where we have neighbors that we really don't like. Somebody smokes, I can smell it through my vent. It's mm -hmm. not illegal. I wish to hell that person would not be in my building and I don't smell it often, but when I do, I wish I could go yell at him, but I can't, it's not illegal. And this is the same thing, just in a different order of magnitude. So that again, is why we are having these conversations so that we can say right now, these, this is, these are the rules of engagement. We would like to have more control over that. So what are the mechanisms available to us to be able to bring order to chaos, as Dave said earlier, a mooring field, anchoring at limitation areas, um, dinghy docks, uh, outright prohibitions. There are lots of different things that you might be able to do. Um, again, we are living in a state where Tallahassee will pretend, preempt us if we sneeze using the wrong brand of Kleenex, right? So we need to be very thoughtful about what we do because if we go far beyond what they deem is correct, which is letting people live on their boats, they will come in as they've done time and time again and said, thank you very much, Miami Beach, but you're not allowed to decide that anymore. They're doing it with us on almost every issue that matters to us. They've done it on basic things that other states take for granted. And if we are not careful about the way we talk about this publicly, they will come in and eviscerate all the things that we have done or are about to do. And so I hear the frustration. I'm not minimizing the concerns. I get it. But we have to be mindful about how we, we do this in a way that yields us collectively the best results and the best results that don't get overturned by people who don't live here making decisions that they don't know anything about. Thank you. Say your name and your question. Patrick Park. Now, this is anecdotal because I'm talking about Chesapeake Bay, where we were losing the world famous. Blue yeah. brand. Yeah. Why? Because of the same reason. And what we discovered was that in order to clear this up, first of all, the federal government has complete control wherever there is a time. It's super deep. That's the power of the story. We became involved in this. And we said that the uh, EPA, junction with the four engineers, the Coast Guard, and so the Coast Guard, the Coast Guard has absolute control. And here is the fundamental problem. And we discover this in Chesapeake Bay and we clean that up. Chesapeake Bay is clean. We now have blue crabs back. And the reason being is that the U.S. Coast Guard came in and enforced all of the regulations. People can say, hey, I have a holding tank and I have a toilet. The reality of it is the U.S. Coast Guard can board, and this is a requirement, there has to be a lock on your holding tank so that you cannot, and this is the problem here, people have a holding tank and they show, hey, I have a holding tank, but they use their toilet See, So what you need, and this is Coast Guard regulation, that they can board you, you don't have a lock because I sailed, believe me, for 40 years, okay? I had a lock on my holding tank. And this is the other thing that has to be done. By the way, there is a uh, an app. It's called Pump Out Nav. And you can download that. And that app will show that on the West Coast of the state of Florida, you have a number of pump out stations, okay? Here... And a sailor is not going to do this, okay? You have one down in uh, Biscayne Bay. And so 
you're not a power pump. You're traveling, if you've turned your engine on, maybe five or six knots, you're not going to travel two hours to pump out. And so what we did, and by the way, the federal government gave us grants of $20,000. So what's your question? It's not a question, it's informative. And okay. it's more important than anything else. This is how we cleaned up a bay. We not only cleaned up this bay, we cleaned up uh, Long Island Sound, uh, uh, Hudson River. Hudson River now has sturgeons. You know, sturgeon is, is a fish that only go in pure water. Okay, so, so we're, we're right. running, we're running out of time. Okay, so here's the here's here is the point that the Coast Guard has absolute control, and the Coast Guard so we should can board you and make the sure Coast you Guard and try to enforce those rules. Okay, last last question. Yes. Yeah. Say that you can get a grant. Or... Yes, but, but we're yeah. way over time. Yeah, uh, we we have. You can talk after. Federal government has the EPA to give you a grant of the twenty thousand dollars. What you need to pass, you need to have pump out folks that will come out. Okay, yeah, that's right. Okay, okay. Yeah. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Two quick questions. Say, yep, you're good. Two quick questions. Um, first of all, there's been no enforcement. That entire bay is a slow zone. We've got speeding boats out there like crazy every day. I'm insane, but there's no enforcement. My question would be, I'm, I, if this is good and this will help this mooring field, I'm not against it. I'm just saying regulation is, is questionable. I mean, regulation is questionable. Second of all, is there a mechanism to remove these boats in the event of a storm? Third question is, do you have to have the adjacent facilities like the dock, like the shower facilities, like the laundry facilities? Does that have to be funded before this is permitted to be built? Thank you. Thank you. Anybody? Do you want to come in? I know someone. I, I, I will tell you something interesting. And I don't know. Um, it You know, um, Murray Skip Park is under redesign right now. And that was, you know, that's kind of the area where there's where there's going to be the mooring field, right? Um, in the in the current design, there are no upland facilities no built in. The upland facilities are not baked into the right. design. Upland. Wow. Uh, shower, shower, bathroom, laundry. So they are not building in. To the design when we're redoing this entire park they're not building that in so why not yeah, they need our i know the answer tell us data fancy islands the neighborhood they don't want people to stay there a long time and they don't want to provide them with laundry facilities or restaurants that's just for yeah so i don't need laundry mat I don't want to try to give the commissioner for the last question. This is the last question you have. I don't want to compromise. When you make things easier, more votes will come. They're going to stay here forever. You know, we are one storm away. From 95% of those buildings in the community. You know who's going to build for that? It's pretty us, taxpayers. So, you know, I, I, I want to bring it to and I want to bring a different perspective today. And I hope you allow me to speak for the first thing. I'm blind. Uh, you know, recently, it's been rough. I mentioned Don't. that Carlos and his wife, they actually do short term on different buildings. Just okay. He's attacking. Uh, it, it certainly seems that okay. the business model is I mean, they buy a boat. For he, he okay. 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 Yeah. No. Carlos. Don't. No. Don't. Carlos. Don't. Okay. 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 David. David. That is what the committee hearing okay. is about. This is a different function. Okay. My whole okay. Okay. Oh, but you can you can talk to everyone after. 
Okay. Okay. We have a venue for this dialogue and other people, David and other. We have a venue for this dialogue with other voices and people who are informed to take place on February 12th. And I encourage anybody who is interested or has relevant information or ideas to come and be a part of that dialogue. There is a bigger conversation to be had. The city of Miami Beach is doing a mooring field um, information session on the 20th of February. That will be published shortly. It'll be on the Facebook page if you get your Miami Beach um, uh, alerts about events happening, you'll find out, and there will be a lot more specific details about what the next steps are. The mooring field is not the same thing as a dinghy dock. It's a different conversation, but that's where you'll get a lot of the, the tactical, like, here's where we are, here's the permitting, here's what we're doing, okay? When was that? The 20th. And that's with the Office of... The City of Miami Beach. Okay. Yep, right. Office of Sustainability. Amy Knowles is the director of that. Thank that's you. Specific questions of the city, right? Yes. Yeah. All right. I want to thank our panelists. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So everyone here, thank you for coming. Um, we have our upcoming events. Um, if you're looking to get involved in this year's election, we have our day of actions every second and first Sunday of the month. We have our general meetings here on February 12th. We have our club elections on February, uh, sorry, March 13th. And if anybody's interested in meeting a uh, former Congresswoman, Debbie Marshall Powell, she will be here on April 4th. Um, next slide, please. And we just want to remind you that we have this election year, uh, and we have candidate Joe Saunders in the back. The slide, I have a slide, but... Uh, jo uh, David Richardson and Joe Saunders and Joe Biden. We have elections, and this doesn't stop here. And everybody's getting up, but the most important thing you can all do is vote. So thank you for coming. Thank you, Amanda. Thank you, you are Amanda. On it's frozen. I made a really nice. I made. I could. One more. Daniel, you want to go? Yeah, it's all right. It wasn't about the plans, it was about learning. Yeah, it was amazing. Wait, I, can we get a picture? Yeah. And then you get it. Wait, me. Like, and then we'll go. Oh, yeah. I think. I think. Yeah.
Yeah, that's <laughs> I
Hola. Sí, So the first I get the site
What is your concern? I know there's a lot, but um, we can give you the picture of your concern. that happen, but it's just for many of the laws being passed that deal with the videos that are scared to be in. What is the way how did that escape to what you're like, who do you know? So that's what you said, maybe it's all the other people who don't think 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 it's all the other people
Yes. Does he Oh, yes, thank you.
see you, Stu.